people are usually stopping and crying by the time she gets done. So, uh, I'm just going to launch into why we're here and how we got here. And then eventually she'll interrupt me and go forward. But, um, we all have you say, uh, <laughs> defining moments in our life where we had to make a decision on where we're going to go with our life and what we're going to do as far as a purpose and a calling. And I have this whole spiel that I have for people, the difference between a calling and a passion. Like this is what you're in the midst of right now and, and with, with Bear. There's, there's things that you do as a calling and then there's things you do as a passion. Like I love movies and golf, but I don't wake up every single day wondering how I can get a better golf swing or how I can, you know, shoot a movie or whatever. But, you know, every single day we get up and we're thinking about how we can protect another child and what we can do to stop predators, how we can do other things to educate enough people so they don't become a victim. And so our defining moment happened in 2004. I'm a, I was a very successful, honest salesman, as she likes to say, and uh, we had the big house at the end of the cul-de-sac, and I had a large format graphics business. I was working with Lance Armstrong and the Grand Prix. I was doing all these big things and had this big house. And she was doing hair at a, a salon that, you know, he, he had to... And had to pay a lot, of, a lot of money to be there. And, the car uh, right here in the and then all of a sudden, we were watching the news one night, and Please. a story came on that completely wrecked our lives. And really, <clears throat> I got you. you know, sometimes you, you wonder why an organization starts or what happens, and you know, oh, it's a passionate thing. I, I just feel like it. this started out of absolute rage. We started this, what we're doing, out of absolute fist-clenching, line-in-the-sand moment of rage. And not to get too graphic, but the story re it was told on the nine o'clock or the ten o'clock news on Channel Nine in Denver, and it was about a dad that had sexually abused his own toddler and videotaped it and put it on the internet for the world to see. And that was that moment where we both had that fist clenching moment, and we're like, "Who does this? Who does this to a child, and why?" And uh, we just didn't really care at that moment because we just wanted to do something about it. But we just knew that we knew that we were called at the exact same moment to get out and do something about it. So, But it was the thousands of people that logged on to watch, right, too. Right, right. Like, the internet was so young that we couldn't track IP addresses. So we know that there's nothing we could do about the two-year-old. But there's something that we could do about every other kid that we would hopefully rescue. Yeah. So we reluctantly, I, I reluctantly moved. We moved out here from Denver, Colorado. Uh, somebody recommended that we join a, uh, a, Bible, go to, go to a Bible school because he said what you're fighting could destroy you and it could, you know, cause us to, you know, be part of the problem, you know, and we'd get a divorce and whatever. So we had to get spiritually trained in order to get into this fight. You had to be equipped. And so we moved here sold everything and we were accused of joining a cult and, and all kinds of really negative, nasty stuff. But we decided to do it anyway and we went to Bible school and got connected to a, an organization that was starting at the time called Stop Child Trafficking Now. And it was focused on the demand side, like going after the bad guy. So we teamed up with Navy SEALs and Green Berets and all these guys and they would go into a community, gather actionable intelligence and go and present that to law enforcement. And sometimes law enforcement would take it, sometimes they wouldn't. But it gave us an opportunity to have a platform to really start talking about human trafficking because really nobody was talking about human trafficking 10 years ago, 12 years ago when we started this thing. And we were in the mayor's office and the attorney general's office talking about the problem. So we had this platform because we were part of an organization that had 40 other cities that were part of this. And we were doing walks and, and raising a lot of awareness. But then at the end of 2012, that organization decided they were going to go overseas and do something else. And because it's a calling and not a passion, uh, we said, well, a month later, we ended up starting the Demand Project in, in our spare bedroom uh, in our home. And we focus on three different crimes. It, it, it encompasses all of sexual exploitation of children, the sex trafficking, the lewd proposals or online enticement, and uh, the child pornography or the you know, child abuse images that are on the internet. So that's what we do. We fight those types of crimes. It's very graphic. And, some, and for me, I was just thinking about looking at all you guys. And sometimes it's really hard to appreciate and put into words gratitude because we deal with so much negative all the time. It's hard sometimes to comprehend and uh, acknowledge such goodness and such great people coming to help what we're doing. But when, when, 
it's just, so for me, it's just an, an amazing gratitude. But, you know, we do a lot of prevention, prosecution, rescue, and restoration. That's how we uh, fight what we fight. Yeah, so with Jason, he's he's already spoken to almost 2,000 kids. 3,000. 3,000 just this month. This like month. Just February. Yeah, so he's going in with 4th, 5th, and 6th graders. Like, I'm out here, so I can't go with him right now. He's in the <coughs> circle of talking to all these kids, and that's huge. Like, our prevention is the most important thing, because if we can arm the kids with enough information and education to not become victims, then we won't even need to be doing what we're doing. But, you know, obviously we have to, but that's our proactive approach. And then um, he's a cyber investigator online, and he acts like a 14-year-old little girl. No, you guys probably, I don't know if Bear told you, but I'm a detective, full-time detective for the Tulsa County Sheriff's Office. Tell them about this bad guy that you just got. Uh, I stole uh, your thunder a little bit, uh, yeah. and I was happy to do it. <laughs> <laughs> he steals my thunder. He always tells everybody all my news. So I'm like, hey, he's going to tell you, but I'm going to tell you first. Well, I, well, seven years ago, I, you know, again, this is favor and, and uh, passion versus a calling. It's my calling. This is our calling to do what we're doing. I should not be a lead detective right now in Tulsa County, leading a whole child predator unit with the amount of experience I have in law enforcement. And Sheriff Regalado hired me out of basically retirement because I was with the, another police department. Uh, it's called, it was Jinx, uh, J-E-N-K-S. And it's a smaller department. And I was very proactive and I was busting bad guys. I know, I don't care about the recording. Okay, like but uh, Jinx did not like the, the attention that I was bringing by busting bad guys. And so they said I couldn't do it anymore. Makes the city look bad with the crime rate going up instead of spinning it to a positive that predators were coming after you. Right. They decided that it made it look bad for people that want to come in and do build to build. Yeah, and to bring money. It came down to a money issue at our yeah. in, 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 So because it's a calling and I'm not I can't be bought, I handed in my badge. Yep. I said I'm done. You know, if you can't allow me to do this, I don't want to even be a part of an organization that's not going to allow me to do what I do. So this was a year and a half, and then uh, I get a call from Sheriff Regalado from the Tulsa County Sheriff's Office, and he says, come and talk to me. And so we laid down the groundwork and talked about what my role and responsibility would be. He um, advised the Criminal Investigative Division at the Tulsa County Sheriff's Office that I was coming and to be prepared. And uh, this, there wasn't that much resistance, but I could tell because I hadn't grown, you know, been in the whole sheriff's office that I was going to have a little bit of resistance. But the last two months, it's been phenomenal. And uh, but last week, I arrested a guy. His twenty-first. My twenty-first arrest. Yes. And uh, he. Uh, what did you want me to say about it? Okay, so this guy on his phone. <laughs> oh, I, I, I pose as a minor, so I'm, I'm interacting with this guy, and so I arrest him. And he doesn't the know marshals, how bad he's going to be. He's no, crazy. the marshals go get him. You know, you know how bad he is, but you don't know how bad they can be or could be. So anyway, I, I got his phone, and I don't want to give too much up because he's still in process, but he had some graphic, graphic, graphic images of children as young as newborns being sexually abused. And so that's what we deal with as an organization, that's what we deal with as people, you know? So when I say it's amazing to have people here like you guys, when we see such evil, and there's so much evil out in the world, I just want to just no! profusely thank all of you. But yeah, so this guy will probably never see the light of day again because of the images that were on his phone. And I'm also working with the National Center for Missing and Exploited Children right now to identify who these kids are because they're clear as day. You know, and I won't go into the, the scenarios of, of what they were doing and what they were involved with, but it was, you know, the worst possible type of abuse on children. And he had it on his phone. And so who, what was fueling him to get to that point where he thought that that was gratifying? Who knows? But that's not my job. There's other ministries that can work through that. You know, I, I pray that he finds a good prison ministry, but I'm not that guy. So then with rescue... I got my private investigator license. I, just, I have to go get my fingerprints, but other than that, I've got my private investigator license. So I started working with Homeland Security and Vice and um, the detention OBN. center and OBN and um, uh, probation, and I started going on undercover operations with OBN. Again, it was it was bizarre 
because we get a call, I get a call from OBN and this agent says, can we meet? I wanna um, talk to you about training us. And so I called OBN right after we got off the phone to make sure this was legit. Because Oklahoma what they had, Bureau of Narcotics. Yeah, Oklahoma Bureau of Narcotics and Human Trafficking. So they had just gone from just strictly narcotics over to human trafficking. So they're used to throwing a bag of coke or whatever drug in the back of their trunk, taking it to evidence. Now all of a sudden, the per it's a person. And they don't know what they're doing. And the person looks like a criminal and they don't want to be messed with because... A, um, let me think, it's a, um, I'll have to think about the quote that I heard, but it's really good, I'll come back to it. So you're dealing with girls that have been trained to be criminals, lured, groomed, controlled, addicted, and then trained to be the criminal element because they're selling themselves or ripping people off. <laughs> So I start going on these undercover operations and pulling people out. And I remember when they brought the first person to me in 20, uh, it was going into 2017. Or, no, I'm sorry. No, 2013. 20, it was going into 2013. It was in 2012. And this, I'm like, oh my gosh, what am I going to do? <laughs> I don't know what to do. And this girl's just coming to me. So I just start doing life with her and just start figuring out what her needs are. Like, this is before like human trafficking was really talked yeah. about. There's like no screening or ways to interview or forensically you know, talk to these girls. It had to be a relational. Yeah, you just had to, I just had to figure it out. So I'm praying and I'm praying hard. I'm in the desert now. I'm like, Lord, you got to help because I don't know what to <laughs> say to this person. I don't, what can I do? You know, who am I? Who am I not? Right? So I just sat down with this girl and pretend that I'm not nervous as I'll get out and then we just start talking and I start figuring out what do you need? What's going on? She had a kid. She had addiction problems. She was living with her mom about to kill each other. It was just a lot of stuff to keep her out of that life that would have been much easier in her mind to go back to. And so I started to just work with people and then we transport girls to a safe location. We've only dealt with a couple of boys so far because it's hard to identify a boy, unfortunately, when it comes to sexual abuse. And so we just started doing this. And, um, and so then with the restoration, what are we gonna do once we find the kids, right? And well, so- and Let me just interrupt. Okay. One time when we were transporting a girl- From Thackerville. From, from an operation, she fell asleep. And this will just tell you the, the trauma that these girls have. Her, she had a wig on and her wig had come off a little bit. And so when she was sleeping, you could see that some um, initials had been carved into her skull. And her pimp had used a hot knife and carved his initials into her skull. And so when she woke up and she was, she's like, oh, oh, sorry, you know, and then she put her, her wig back on. So that's the kind of trauma that these girls are going through. And that's just a glimpse of just a, a fraction of what they do. So we're, you know, we don't have a place and we don't really want a place, right? <laughs> it's too much liability and too much work. And so um, we just, I build, I start building this program and I get an intern. So we build it together. It's her practicum. She's a social worker. So we start building a program, meeting the needs of your mental, physical, spiritual, financial, educational, and legal. How are we going to help in all those areas from the mental trauma to then banged in the head so many times they have ear problems, brain damage, you know, just all of these issues. Criminal records. Obviously vaginal issues and and then going down to spiritual issues because it's been perverted and twisted. And they take like Catholicism and they take Illuminati Wiccan. and they take all yeah, Wiccan stuff and like astral astro what am I saying? Astrology. Astrology and they combine it into one and make it seem like they're the, the pimps, the pastor. And so we're, un, and so that's the spiritual abuse because, you know, they just twist and pervert the Lord. And then you've got the, the educational abuse because nobody cares about these kids and they can hardly read, can hardly write. And then you've got legal situations. I'm finding all these kids in detention. They're all in detention, busted for crimes that they were made to commit. The, one of the worst scenarios was a little girl she was 15 and she was bound from her arms and legs and we're taking her into the interview room and she's telling about how this pimp 
one of probably eight pimps because she had been trafficked around the United States. And she's popping bubble gum in her mouth because she's just a kid. And she's telling the story about this pimp that she was in love with that she thought that they were in love with each other and she got pregnant and he, he beat her so bad that she lost the baby. And he threw the baby in a box and threw it in the back. And so she's, she had told me the story before and I said, let's back up, sorry, spaghetti noodle. She had told me the story before in detention. I said, do you want to talk to law enforcement? Because we're law enforcement friendly, obviously, and most service providers are not. Law enforcement's the bad guy. You don't talk, when they bring them in, we don't talk to you anymore. We are not that way, so we're not liked always, <laughs> because we believe justice comes with getting that bad guy off the street and acknowledging to that victim that they were a victim. So I said, do you want to talk to law enforcement? She said, yes, yeah. so I called Homeland Security and I said, hey, Darren, I got this girl and the story is a little out there, but I believe this kid. So I said, we you come and talk to her? So that's when we go into the interview room with her lawyer that was working with her and me and Homeland and she's popping bubble gum with her hands cupped, telling the story, crying on one hand and then laughing on the other because she's all mixed up. Karen actually went to Texas where this happened. She was trafficked in Houston and Dallas, and this was in Dallas. And he actually went to the house where she described the whole house, described what he did to her, described the abortionist on site, described everything about what was going on. They even looked for the baby. Everything was legit. This guy got like 22 years in prison. Like, isn't that amazing? Like, he got 20 plus years in prison for this little girl. Just think of what that did to her. I mean, there's a part of her that would be upset because she thought she loved him. Do you understand why they love these guys? Like, think of being, you know, 10, 11, 12 years old. What do we want? We want the rib. We want the guy. We want the approval. We want the attention. We need it as girls. If you get them young and you're able to lure them and groom them and control them, get them addicted, get them into a survival mentality, I wish I could think of the quote. I will get my phone and look at that quote because I wrote it down. Oh, their unfamiliar captivity is safer to them than their familiar, than, no, their familiar captivity is safer to them than an unfamiliar freedom. I heard that and I got goosebumps all the way up to my head. I'm like, oh my gosh, that's it. It was a pastor that said that because he had a problem with pornography and he had gone through so much. And this little girl, I mean, she may have been, um, they may have helped her to see that this was a bad guy, but she still had so much to unravel. So I wanna come all the way back around to what we're doing here. So in 2017, we're having a summit, we have a conference, and we train law enforcement, Homeland, we partner with Homeland Security, Nick Mick, and National Center for Missing and Exploited Children, and now the Sheriff's Department, and we're on our fourth one this year, we just did it, and so we train like service providers and law enforcement and legal, because we have a legal department that help kids get their records expunged and help adults. And so we're doing this training, and this guy walks in, and I just took credit. I'm thinking, God sent him to me, I am sure. But he did not, he did not. He's very sly. Because this guy walks in, and he hears Jason speak, and he said, that's that, that's him. So he goes up to Jason, and he said, hey, I have this property, and he said, go talk to my wife. Just let her handle it. So see, it's his fault. Because he said, go talk to my wife. And so he put it in my hand. So God knew he needed to go through Jason first, and then come to me. So I bring uh, Janine and Sharon around to hear what happened, or what he had to say. And he tells me about this property that he has, and he's trying to, he's tried to sell it, he's tried to give it away, nobody will take it, and he just oh, sorry. Sorry. You can't shut down the singing bus. <laughs> <laughs> We have the same boss. <laughs> <laughs> it's okay. <laughs> okay. So, and I had said, oh, 
for years, I said, we will never be a property because Jason will divorce me if I do one more thing. And then I never even threw that word out there. Ever. I know. She and I tells don't, a story. I don't say that anymore. <laughs> I say, I'm, I say, we'll never be millionaires now. We're never, ever, ever going to be millionaires because reverse psychology with the Lord. Because all of a sudden, we have 54 <coughs> acres and nine buildings that this this person is offering us for free. So for I free. for free. So I don't do anything for awesome. three weeks. Like I don't even call. I don't know why. I just put it off for three weeks. And I called and I didn't bring anybody with us because I didn't want anybody to change the vision, right? So me, Jason, and Hannah and Joshua come up here and I'm like, oh! and Jason's like, who's gonna mow it? <laughs> <laughs> well, and for a long time nobody was mowing it. I'm like, oh, he was right. But so in 2017, June of 2017, they quit claimed it over to us for a buck, you know? Wow. And they and paid it. They actually <laughs> paid all of these for us to take That's it over. No. All of these are the old, the way that all of the buildings looked when we stepped foot on property, and they were rough. But obviously it was a diamond in the rough. We knew we were in for a lot of work, but we also knew that the blessings were there. I, I, we needed brand new toilets. So I called and got a brand, like Mansfield, I think in Illinois, donated 26 toilets. And I'm like thinking, that was an amazing <laughs> blessing. This is going to be easy. And then they went to the delivery room, and oh she was the gosh. only one. I was the only one here. So we got the blessing, but then, oh my gosh, it's going to be a lot of work. Well, she so had to unload all the toilets pulls herself. pulls up in a semi. <laughs> this first semi He's a freight driver, so dock to dock. And He's you know, if you know anything about dock to dock, guys. He's an older guy. He pulls up, and it's raining outside, and I'm all by myself. And... He comes in, I said, let's just go right here to the dining hall. So he backs up, and then he proceeds to sit there. It's like, okay, here you go. Yeah. I had to pull all those toilets out of that truck. 26 of them. But the bottom and the top. And so I got them all out, and the last two, I jerked the dolly back and broke two. And I said, I think you better leave really fast. I've never had a man come up here and make me do all the work while you just sat there. He said, it's not my job. I'm like, okay, get out of here. I'm going to lose my witness. So it was like that throughout the whole thing. I mean, it was one thing after the other like that. It, and that's how this hurt whole journey has been. Yeah. It's been just blessing, amazing blessings, and then, and then we have setbacks. <laughs> yeah. and then we have blessings, and then we have setbacks. And you guys saw the, the lift station. There's been so many hands that have touched it, pre, like acting as if they knew what they were doing, but really making it harder for us. So when, so you had asked, how did we get you guys here? So we had our open house. It was, I think our second one. <laughs> second or third. <laughs> because I thought we were gonna be open by March 4th, that first year, but we marched 4th right past it. And then I thought we were gonna be over the next March 4th, and then may the 4th be with you, and nothing kept happening. But, so now um, we don't give dates anymore. We don't, I'm like, I don't know soon. I don't know. And so we have our open house and we invited all law enforcement in through our um, head of security and Chuck knows Alex. So we had the whole circle lined with cop cars. And For we those just... that are unaware, Alex is on the board of Grindstone and we fellowship together at Shelf Far Mountain. He's the cop that was is over there <laughs> who has <laughs> taken the bus car. away from the baby yeah. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> be ashamed so, continue. so alex comes up you know and, and he's listening to what we say and we take him down to bethany and that I, I'm sure like everybody, if you look at these, it was bad. Like it was grandma and grandpa's house, grandma Wilkinson, grandpa had a, like I would have thought it was a serial killer. There was like 150, 200 nails in the wall for no particular reason. Apparently it was for every lure that he had though. He was a good guy. <laughs> there was just weird stuff, right? It was, it's pretty rough. And so we took, gave him a tour and cast a vision of what we want to do down there. So every single kid that we can, or person, boy, girl, girl whatever, um, adult, because we have non-residential, so every single one will go to that particular house. It'll be our crisis center. So in a perfect world, what would happen? Let's say Alex gets the call. Like he does a, a bust and he finds like a couple of kids. And he says, Kristen, we have a couple of kids. So me or me and Jason or whoever will be up here and then we'll have our team, our crisis team, and we'll bring them in 
through the intake room. We'll do the intake right there with law enforcement on the other side. We'll assess those six areas, like I said. Um, you're gonna find out, well, you guys might not find out, whoever comes back. <laughs> we have medical beds over there that weigh a lot. They weigh a lot, but they're gonna go down there so we can do minor assessments on the girls for whatever's going on physically, and we can do their mental health and see if they're addicted to drugs. If they can come up the hill, then we bring them up here and they start in Salome, where unfortunately the epidemic happened. You're welcome. I know. Um, so they'll start in Salome, 30 days, <coughs> they'll stay there, we'll be able to assess how they are, and we'll just start life with them. It won't be like a boot camp where you can't wear makeup, you can't have green hair, I don't care what hair they have. Like, I do hair, so I don't care what, they can have all the rainbow colors if they want to. I had Hannah half blue, half green one time. Um, so it's not like we're just stripping them down to nothing, because there's nothing inside. You can't worry about the inside when there's nothing there. You know, and they don't want to be ugly going through the program, so they want to start slow. And then after 30 days, if they can stay in the program, they'll come over to this side for 17 months. And we'll just do life. They'll do school, they'll do chores, they'll hopefully go to a chapel soon. They'll just be doing life here with the house guardian and their journey team. So they'll have a mentor, therapist, and a case manager. They'll have life skill coaches. They'll have group therapy. Hopefully this will be Central Park out here where they can walk a track, they can do hammock park, they can have fireside chats, they can play basketball. Like we wanna bring them back to where they're at or where they should have been. Just bring them back, have life simple again, if it's ever even been simple. So we just wanna unravel what's happened to them and get them on a better path and then find a place for them to go, hopefully a home, or if they can graduate, they can go in our transitions house and get a trade, maybe a scholarship. So some one of you guys said, how are we doing so far? Nobody has stayed or they'd be here right now. That's all I can tell you is nobody's still here except Jimmy. That's it. Everybody has left. Like I'm always out here by myself now. And so when Alex said, hey, I've got, there's this ministry, I'm like, yeah, sure. Mm -hmm. And Jason said, hey, and he said, well, I don't know why if we're going to go out and do day <coughs> disaster relief, we can't do here. And I said, well, I don't know why not either. And, but I still thought, sure, uh -huh. we'll see, we'll see. And so I didn't hear for months. So I'm like, I hope so. Come on, Jesus, I hope so. Because we're not going to open if we don't get this stuff done. And especially with the septic and the well. And so all of a sudden, Alex says, can you meet me and TJ? I'm there. And then I meet TJ. And I knew immediately. Like, I just started rambling off the vision. And when he said, okay, let's stop and start all over. Let's go back outside. I'm like, oh, this is like serious. I said, hold on. Hold Let me on. get a piece of paper. Yes. And seven pages of paper later. <laughs> I said, I need to talk to my wife, <laughs> you did. and I'll get back to you. Yeah. He's like, so. I'm going to cast this to my wife. I'm like, okay. <laughs> and now look at what y'all are doing. And we can't open if we can't pass DEQ. <laughs> so I was trying really hard not to pull anybody anyway. But when Keith said, well, you want to show me the law? I said, I'll show you everything. <laughs> and so we went all the way around. Because honestly, we can do everything, but if we don't have the water running, and we don't I don't know if you noticed, but I think, but I think that's, per, that's the reason why. Our people, I could be laying in bed, polluting Salome. Dying. <laughs> coronavirus. And these animals are getting after it anyway. I literally, I'm going to go down there and work tomorrow and have no idea where to even begin. Because so much has happened since the last time I turned the screw down there. Which is incredible. Amazing. And that's all a testament to the Father. And he's awesome. Continue. So, this is, you know, when you ask how have we done so far, like Jason said, I mean, there's no way to tell you how you've done so far except looking at the pictures.
and knowing what's going to happen in there. And I feel that the reason we keep getting such amazing things donated to us, you know, that look beautiful. I mean, we have to do all the work to get it out here and to get it in there and to get it. But at least, be, I mean, they don't understand. Somebody gives us all the beds. Okay, well then you have to get a trailer up here and then we have to unload the beds and then we have to get them in the houses and then we have to make the beds. Like, and then we almost lost a couple houses to green mold. Like everybody says here and then they walk away and we're like, oh my gosh, what are we and, gonna do? And that was part of the hesitation of taking this property because I'm the guy, and I've said this before, that when the uh, fire smoke alarm's going off in the middle of the night, I'm the one that takes it off puts it in a drawer, and covers it with towels, and puts it away. I forgot to tell the Lord I wanted a handyman. Yeah. <laughs> and she said she never wanted to be married to a cop. Yeah, I didn't know the cop, the handyman, and he doesn't have any more hair. <laughs> hey, it just got real. It just got real. I got a her. <laughs> yeah. But yeah, I mean, you guys, you just don't. I mean, I, I hope you have an idea. Do you guys have an idea of how huge yeah. this is? Well, you guys are sowing into changing lives. Like, I've talked to a few of you, you know, me and Steve have had some talks, and you've done amazing things in the world, you know, throughout the United States, and you've helped people. This one is just on a little bit of a different scale because every kid that comes out here, you guys are touching in some way. You know, everything, you'll touch them. You're sewing into all of this and there's no words for that. That's all eternal. So that's all I got unless you got questions. One of the things that occurred to me the first time I heard y'all give this talk, which we discussed last time, is that a lot of what Grindstone has done thus far was the give us this day our daily bread. This puts y'all in a position to erase generational curses. That's massive. Because this isn't linear. It's cumulative. It's snowball effect. It's massive. And I have no earthly idea how to do what y'all do, but I can do this. And I'm glad that we get to do this. Yeah. So thank you for letting us do this. Yeah. 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 Yes, Jeremy will mow for you. <laughs> it's just a short drive from Illinois. Right. <laughs> Every weekend. Um, Once a week. That's yeah, week. It's so. I think it, I, I want to say this. I, I've talked to everybody a little bit. It is amazing to me, because I live here, not far an hour away, to see people come from so far away. And Jay Johns, I've talked to him, and the Madden Kelp, not talk in person, but internet crap, right? And the meet them is nice, and I thank you for that. But I thank you guys for doing this. I told you personally earlier about the career you chose. Um, you're, you're an angel on, on earth. Uh, it's just cool to meet all of you and to see that you go so far to do this. Yeah. It's yeah. awesome. What's all of you? Yeah, yeah. absolutely. Well, that's uh, definitely our prayer for everybody that's here that's sewed into this. We, we pray a thousand fold return on everybody. You know, we, we pray when you guys leave that you'll get home safe and, and that you'll be blessed with your businesses and, and that, you know, you'll just get such a major return on this. If not, maybe here, but in heaven, you'll, you'll get that. Good job. But here for sure. Well, I feel that 10,000 is coming. <laughs> or the or the fence down there. I do. I feel I I have a good talk with the Lord today. So I feel it's coming. So all that we're missing guys is just finishing up this, getting the DEQ in and then getting those two house gardens and then ready to roll. And then we're gonna have that first little girl that's yeah. gonna be at the bottom of the hill and we're gonna have her cut the ribbon. Yeah. And have her walk up here. And see and see this. <laughs> 
for your inspection, what what do you have left that you know for sure that needs to be done for your inspection? So um, I did all I did the fire inspection. I got to I just haven't done three houses, four, five, and six. So if you go or three, four, and five. I'm sorry, three, four, and five. So it's just those three houses, and it's just because the paperwork got kicked back. I have no idea why. I don't know. We didn't do anything different. So Jimmy's putting the lights on the outside of the houses, front and back. He couldn't be here because he had issues with his truck, but hopefully tomorrow. And then these two exit signs is the only thing that's stopping this from being um, done in here. And I have the signs. If you have the signs, I'll get them up And tomorrow. that's it in this one, like fire inspection. Right, and right. He, when you say DEQ, for those that don't yeah. know, that's the Department of Environmental Quality, and that's the septic and the well mm -hmm. we ordered today uh the two pumps that we needed for the septic and then keith is taking care of the well because he's a badass yes. and yeah. he's had assistance so thank you to all the other badasses yeah um Bad so we will i will have your new septic pumps in approximately eight days assuming that amazon amazon's appropriately uh but in time that when we come here in phase three those will be installed so the water quality, drinking water, and the septic should be handled by phase three. Get those fire signs up, you get your paperwork back on three, four, and five. We get Bethany House done, we're looking at two house guardians. Yeah. Yep. yep. Because we got the, the health department, I was shocked. He went in and came out as fast as he went in, and he said, looks great. He looked at the stove, and I'm thinking, because I wasn't going to bring him in. And he said, looks good. I'm like, really? And I thought, shut up. <laughs> <laughs> like we painted it, but I just left it alone. And so he, he passed the whole thing. So yeah, the DEQ is it. I heard they're not very friendly sometimes. But I got. I know a guy at DEQ. Okay. I'll call him. Because as soon as it's the chlorine injector on it, because it hasn't been on it, so it's not going up in the tank. We've only put chlorine chlorine in there like once. But you know, if you don't have the septic pumping, we got 60 kids out here, we're gonna have a mess. And we cross the river with any of our waste and we're in trouble. Mm -hmm. So trouble. huge, oh, huge yeah. to have this done. I mean, I knew this was all a miracle, but I didn't think by the end of today, <laughs> we would have had a solution and able to open. Not That's only, huge. not only, are the people here that needed to be here to make that happen. Right. But there was a question mark as to whether or not some of the certain individuals could be here to make it happen. It's like, yeah, what a coincidence. We just happen to be hurling through space at 17,500 miles an hour on, on an inanimate object and none of this matters and it's all random, right? Right. Right. I mean, me, Keith, walk around, we pull Adam, and then little by little, don't call Adam Little. He gets upset. <laughs> <laughs> that was good. We'll, we'll talk after this. <laughs> it's a contest. It was a mess. I mean, Keith is sure that things were done like malicious, and we've had a lot of weird people up here. Like, I've had to undo so much stupid stuff. People stepping in five gallon buckets of paint and walking throughout the house and taking roller brushes and going through real quick, quick and letting it drip down. Pipes and, breaking in houses and ruining ceilings. And not putting things back up and doing a real halfway job. Taking all our light bulbs, cutting them and using them for pipes to get stoned out here. And I'm oh, like, wow. come on! <laughs> yeah, I mean... Is so somebody staying here now full time? To no, help that's... That? No, um... No, they were helpers. <laughs> no, that's... <laughs> no, they were helpers. I thought that was like candles <laughs> coming in. No. No, <laughs> no we had... Because I... They were Christian addict in recovery. Christian alcoholics yeah. addicts in recovery. Sure. And I got them for three days a week. And I couldn't say no. And I didn't know what they, all they were doing. And one would badmouth the other one that would badmouth the other one and say, oh, no, this guy's an expert. He wasn't an expert. But there were some diamonds in the rough. There was. There was a few that kept it from burning down, for sure. But they did all the electrical down in Bethany, and I'm pretty sure. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I, I have. <laughs> 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 
legit <laughs> stop. <laughs> because the fact that there's, you, you know what, you hit it. How many beds in the nation are there? So there's under 100 beds that are focused for underage girl or victims of human trafficking. Under 100. And how many is are here? And we will add 60 beds to that number. <coughs> and we will be the largest in the whole entire United States here. The only closest one is in Texas at 45. And then there, for the all human trafficking victims, um, adults and minors, that are specific to this, there's under 400. So one of our plans is to train people on how to work with a victim of human trafficking so we can get more places to open beds. So that's what I want to talk to just for a minute. Yeah. Because there's 400 beds nationwide. Whole entire United States. It's a $150 billion per year industry. You could buy every single Starbucks franchise in the world, every single Target store in the world, and every NBA team every year and not come up with enough money to match what is spent on human trafficking every year. And there are 400 beds in the country, that's it, to help combat this. And so I think it's imperative that y'all get this thing up and running and then pilot a program that can then be expanded from there elsewhere. That's, uh, what, that's what she's going to be doing. She's, you know, I don't know if you guys knew this, but she's in the Trump administration uh, to help yeah, come back to the traffic. People are real slack. <laughs> um, and so wherever the next facility is or needs to be, I want to know because we'll be there too. I mean, I heard a statistic recently, it's the number one fastest growing crime in the world and the cartels are getting into it big because you can sell a sack of heroin one time. You could sell a five-year-old 10 times a day for 10 years. If think about lasts. that. If, if, she lasts. if she lasts. We don't think she will. Think about that. And so I want to kill those people, but I can. But I can help facilitate this. So, I mean, I, just, and, you know, it's okay. and, and Alex, I don't really, care. That's, 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 <laughs> I don't care. <laughs> you know, I've come into contact with girls. I mean, I had a case one time where I arrested a bad I took over this girl's account and I pretended to be her to chat with the bad guy. She didn't even have any contact with this guy. And when I arrested him, it, everybody kind of figured out who it was because he had groomed mom. Uh -huh. And so she had no contact with this guy. But she got traumatized from it and had gotten developed eating disorders and all kinds of stuff. So can you imagine? And anyway, I've had other cases where it, like one assault happened to this one girl and it destroyed her whole life. You know, the, the trust issues and, and drug addiction and bad relationships. Can you imagine somebody at 10 years old or 12 years old that's had to have sex with 10 to 20 people a day for years? What that does to her spirit? So that's who's going to be coming up here. Yeah. And people that come here are not just Oklahoma. But no, no, we're throughout the nation. So we're working on making those connections with people with planes because I've had to take kids across to like from here to Kansas City and back and then go pick them up and come back. And it's a lot. It's a lot to have to go all the way across. Or to t I had to take a kid to Texas to do the one that I told you about to do a grand jury trial. It'd be much easier if I had a plane to, uh, to use to pick up a kid, bring him here, take a kid from that crisis center. We only have 23 hours, and so then where are we gonna take him? And there's not many beds, so we don't have a lot of choices, but we can take him to another program if there's no beds available that are specific to human trafficking. It's just that they won't know how to deal with them. Honestly, there's so, somebody said here, you can't, uh, I think it was Amanda. Yeah. She said, you can take up, you, you can take this, the girl off the street, but not the street out of the girl. It is really hard to take that street out of those kids. And they're in survival mode, and all they know is manipulation and, and chaos. They don't like peace. We would be very threatened because we have the peace of Jesus. And so unraveling that enough, 
you don't really want to take them somewhere that they don't understand it because the last interview just uh, yesterday while you guys were working, me and Leanna did an interview with this one gal that might be a house guardian. And the minute she said, this is going to be fun, I said, goodbye. <laughs> goodbye. <laughs> you have no idea. No, it's not. It's not. That's not the joy you're going to get. It's not going to be summer camp. It's not. Yeah. It's going to be tough. It's going to be rough. It's going to be emotional. happy. It's going to be sad. Total emotional roller coaster. That's not the kind of happy it's going to be. This isn't going to be fun. We'll have moments of fun. This is going to be serious work. So taking them somewhere else that think this is going to be fun, they, they'll run. They'll take off. One little girl that I did take to Kansas City, oh my gosh, she picked up beds, slammed them into the drywall, and busted up the drywall. This is so demonic. It was her dad that used her. Her mom shot embalming fluid no. as her drug of choice. Oh. Dad started selling, uh, using her as a recruiter and then started using her as one of his girls and to get other girls. So we can't take them just anywhere. We have to train these people up, go around the United States and get more beds open. But until we do that, we've got this. And so <laughs> with people like you, wow. Can you believe it? We're about to open. I'm not going to tell anybody, though, because nobody's yeah. going to believe it. Like, <laughs> if something happens, and I, <laughs> I say one more time, we're going to March 4th or May 4th. What if we do get March 4th? That would be that's, third time, third try. Yeah, I know. <laughs> <laughs> but look, Keith is on it, man. <laughs> now, I saw on your website something about a gala or... Yeah, we have a gala coming up on March 27th. March 27th. So, you guys, you know, this is going to take millions of dollars to do. Like, we can't... We've been asking <coughs> about hundred and fifty to $200,000 a year with just the demand project. The demand project doing prevention, prosecution, rescue, restoration. And that was okay to have an office and get... So a small staff that of volunteers that we never paid <laughs> like we've been strictly volunteer run and we can't do that anymore so we stepped into paying Leanna our clinical director which was a huge step of faith so every she makes more than both of us combined no the whole demand project combined <laughs> the whole thing I'm like oh my gosh can we really do but we this? had to for <laughs> DHS licensing and we she still to. took a $20,000 a year pay cut so but she gets to take over the program part so I can go out and go fishing and bring them in. And then she gets to clean them and get them going through the program. Then I can go out and fish again and bring them in. So um, the gala is one of our awesome events. Like you get to dress up and uh, blue is the color for human trafficking. So it's dressy, it's dressy attire with a, a splash of blue. And we'll have a diamond station with cubic zirconians and one thirty-five hundred dollar diamond, I hope. And we'll have a live and silent auction. So if you know people that would want to come, it's going to be on the twenty-seventh in Tulsa. I will get that information to Alex for you. Okay. Okay. Awesome. And we need interns too, you guys. Like, if you know anybody at colleges, we're we're such a good training ground for interns because they have to do a good job for their grade. And so we get free work and they get to get they get to learn. So, you know, the sky's the limit of what we need out here. We just need everything. And you guys are always welcome to come back and see how things are running and see what we're doing. We need male mentors that aren't requiring anything from these girls except just teaching them that there's good men out there, male, male, male uh, father figures. So, like, maybe sometime we could get you all back here and you guys could sit by that beautiful stone fireplace that somebody's going to build out there in the central park. Right now it's just a fire pit. <laughs> yeah. That'll, be, that'll work well, well with, some, with some lounge chairs <laughs> yeah. marshmallows. Yeah. Thanks for listening, guys. Yeah. I think we 